Welcome to Actera's second lecture for our fall 2020 series. This lecture is titled Greenwashing Our Food, The Truth Behind Sustainable Labels. My name is Robbie Brown. I am the Community Engagement Associate for Actera. Before we begin, I want to go over some Zoom logistics. Your webcam and your microphone are disabled for this event, as well as the chat box. However, we will have a Q&A portion after our keynote speaker's presentation. If you'd like to uh, submit a question for the Q&A portion of the event, there is a Q&A tab within the Zoom app. It's located near the chat box tab. What you'll want to do is select that, and then you'll see a pop-up appear on your Zoom application. Go ahead and just uh, type in and submit your question there, and we'll receive it on our end. If you're not familiar with Actera, we're an environmental nonprofit based in the Bay Area. We're driven by environmental problems occurring locally and globally, primarily the problems that have resulted due to climate change. We engage with our local communities, companies, and agencies in the Bay Area with a focus on Santa Clara and San Mateo counties. We have a wide variety of programming under the categories of electrification, food sustainability, workplace sustainability, and education. For our education component, we have our public lecture series like the one tonight, our Youth Be the Change program, and the Climate Resilient Communities program. For our lecture series, we invite leading voices from academia, business, and policy to discuss global climate change issues. Actera does not endorse or support the expressed opinions of any of our speakers. Our aim is to merely present a diverse range of views to help advance these conversations and to allow deeper reflections on challenging issues. We would like to thank our series underwriters for their support, Mary and Clinton Gilliland, and Ar Armand and Elian Nukermans. We'd also like to thank our series sponsors, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District and the Foster in Palo Alto. And then last but not least, a special shout out to 350 Silicon Valley Food and Climate Team for being a community partner. We have just a few, uh, few more events that we're hosting for the remainder of the year. The next one is on November 18th with our executive director, Lauren Weston. Um, she invites you to a virtual conversation with two speakers from our citizen, sorry, not from ours, but from Citizens Climate Lobby as they discuss pricing pollution as a climate solution. On December 9th, Actera's Young Professionals is hosting a virtual happy hour. This is a great way to meet other young professionals who are interested in working in the environmental field at our uh, virtual meet and greet. There will be opportunities to network in the play hall day themed games. December 16th, we have the last lecture of this series, Creating Carbon Rich Soil is a Next Generation Solution to the Climate Crisis. Uh, join us for a conversation with members of Heirs to Our Oceans, our ACCE initiative, Regenerative Agriculture for Climate Communities and Our Environment. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is that we officially launched My Healthy Play, Our Healthy Planet online community. This is a great way to connect with like-minded individuals that are interested in plant-based eating. Um, in this community, we share our recipes, we share photos of food that we cooked, we um, talk about plant-based events in the area, we recommend plant-based restaurants in the Bay Area. It's a lot of fun. Um, if you're interested in joining, we will be sending you the official invitation after this event. Our keynote speaker tonight is Hope Bowenek. She's been active in animal protection and environmental activism for 30 years and has published the book, The Ultimate Betrayal, is there happy meat? And on that note, we are gonna raffle off one copy of her book at the end of this event. So if you do wanna qualify for the raffle, please make sure you stay to the very end after the Q&A portion when we announce the winner. Uh, she is also the host of Hope for the Animals podcast, the project manager for the national nonprofit United Poultry Concerns, and the executive director of Compassionate Living, which is a California-based vegan advocacy organization. Over the last three decades, Hope has given countless presentations, written innumerable articles, and organized hundreds of events, including UPC's annual Conscious Eating Conference at UC Berkeley and the Sonoma County Veg Fest. With that being said, Hope, I am now going to hand it off to you if you feel ready. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Robbie, and uh, I uh, thank Actera for having me and I hope that everyone can hear me okay. If there's any problems, Robbie, let me know. Uh, but uh, hopefully we're all good and I appreciate everyone being here. So I am going to share my screen. So let me make sure that that works here. 
so I can, uh, here we go. Uh, hopefully everybody can see that. If I don't hear from you, Robbie, I will know everything's okay. <laughs> um, everything looks fine. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> All right, wonderful. So I wanna just start with just a little bit about me quickly uh, and just a little bit of my background and uh, what brought me to this place and, and knowing that what I know. And I have been vegan for 30 years. And when I, I was first really inspired into activism from Greenpeace and in the, in the 80s, uh, I was in high school and uh, there would be actions on TV for, that Greenpeace was doing these radical, you know, banner hangings and the uh, wonderful direct action that, that Greenpeace was doing at the time and it was very inspiring to me. And I actually got a job with Greenpeace right out of high school. Uh, and uh, through the environmental community, I learned about the plight of the redwoods in Northern California and the, uh, the, the, the sequoias, the ancient redwoods being cut. And that really called to me, it touched my heart and I packed my car up and drove up to California, never been to California in my life. And I started doing actions with Earth First, the direct action, the blockading of logging roads and tree sits. And I was up in a tree sit for uh, uh, for a about three months. That was just a hammock. We never did make a platform of wood. We were just in a hammock connected to four trees for about three months. Um, it was very extreme and intense and wonderful and inspiring. And that whole time I was already vegan. Uh, and I was reading about veganism. Of course, we did not have the internet at that time. So if you wanted to learn something, you had to read a book. Uh, what have we lost? <laughs> so <laughs> we've gained so much with the internet. I mean, we wouldn't be doing this without the internet. So, you know, there's, there's good and bad. But anyway, we used to read books, these things called book called books. <laughs> and um, uh, so I was reading about veganism and the, the farmed animals were really calling me, like really, uh, I, I felt um, that they were the ultimate underdogs being, uh, uh, you know, confined and treated so brutally and killed at such a young age and in such large numbers. And, uh, and, and so few people were speaking out for them at that time. And so I really got drawn into uh, vegan activism, farmed animal activism, animal rights activism. And there was a lot of different issues at the time that people were working on. And I brought those radical tactics from that I learned with Earth First down to the Bay Area. And we did blockading of slaughterhouses and lockdowns and all kinds of things that you'd know nothing about because there was no internet. Uh, and so it was very hard to tell our own story and weave our own narrative at the time when we were reliant on mainstream media only. Anyway, uh, I'll just wrap it up by saying the environmental component is is very at my roots uh, and uh, and has always been a very important part to me. And, and that connection there, it, I, I'm so grateful to see that finally, 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 the environmental community is more being more open and embracing more and, and, and wanting to learn more. So it's very exciting. I'm glad to be here. And I want to start with the big picture because I think it's important to get a baseline before we get into talking about the sustainable labeling. I think it's important to get just kind of a, a base of what animal agriculture's impact is on the environment. And I know this is probably an educated audience and, and a lot of you might already know these things, but let's just um, uh, get, get a baseline of what's going on. So animal agriculture's impact on the environment is huge. And it is a, a huge part of climate disruption, massive energy consumption, deforestation, uh, loss of biodiversity, habitat, species, excessive water use, water pollution, air pollution, soil degradation, uh, wasting of food, grain, resources, it goes on and on. And I have an entire PowerPoint presentation of just this uh, that I also do, but, uh, but again, I, like I said, I think this is a more educated audience. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about something a little bit different, but I do still wanna touch on some of these points with the larger picture. And one is fossil fuel use because it's so much harder to 
see, to really see with animal products because with like say transportation, which is another personal impact, huge, you know, something that, that uh, as at, on a personal individual level that we do that's impactful of course is driving. And we see the gas, we've got actual liquid fossil fuel gas going into the tank. We've got the emissions coming out. It's very obvious, you know, it's very visual. Uh, but with a package of meat at the grocery store or a, a dairy, a carton of dairy, it's not, as it's not as easy to see the connection. It's more difficult. So what's going on there is that it takes eight times as much fossil fuel to produce animal products as it takes to produce plant foods. There's just massive amounts of energy in the processing of animal foods, the slaughterhouse, there's indoor environments, conveyor belts, milking machines, lighting, heating, the mechanized slaughter process, all of this contributes to fossil fuel consumption, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, so much more than growing plants. And we'll get into more about it, but also uh, transportation. There's many more steps. There's grain brought to the animals, animals to auction, animals to slaughter, carcass to processing, product to market. All of those steps uh, often have transportation between each step. So a lot of fossil fuel use. Uh, deforestation, again, I'm sure many of you already know this, but uh, cattle ranching is the primary reason for the Amazon rainforest being destroyed. If they're not grazing the cattle, uh, actually having the cattle on the land, then they're growing the grain that's fed to livestock. Uh, so that is, you know, it's, it's, it's the number one driver of deforestation in the Amazon. And then in the US, talking about the US and not the Amazon, over 400 million acres of is pasture and range land. Uh, that could all be reforested if we just didn't eat animals. Hundreds of millions of additional acres going goes to growing the, the feed for the livestock. Again, a, a huge portion of that could be rewilded. Um, and this gets into our topsoil, you know, one of our most overlooked a precious natural resources. It is getting a lot more attention now. Luckily, I've been talking about it for 30 years, but finally people are getting, you know, topsoil is that um, dark nutrient rich uh, soil that you need. It's vital for growing plant life. And one of the best ways, of course, to build soil is to rewild, to reforest in the forest. That's where uh, topsoil is being created. So We'll get a little more into that when we get into the labels. But one uh, last piece, well, a couple more things on the big picture. Uh, you know, great, uh, growing, grazing livestock is uh, globally, livestock production is one of the leading causal factors in biodiversity, uh, loss of biodiversity, and a key factor in a loss of species. Uh, livestock occupy a vast area that was once wildlife. Uh, and could be again. Um, they, you know, they, they compact and trample the soil that creates uh, runoff, uh, flooding, erosion. There's all kinds of problems that come from having uh, lots of, of animals, farmed animals in small spaces. So it's also uh, water wasted, the amount of water it takes to produce just one month's worth of food for someone who eats meat and dairy. You can use that same amount of water to grow food for a vegan for a year. That's how much water is saved on the vegan diet. So there's, and how this works is that there's, you know, you've got to water the livestock, of course, the water that's going to growing the grain to feed the animals, and then washing all the factory equipment, washing the slaughterhouse equipment and the dairy farms and all the manure. And so anyway, um, one more thing I am going to talk about with the big picture before we get into the, into the labels, and I'm going to go uh, label by label and, and kind of break it down. But one more thing that I really want to talk about, and this is because it's an environmental audience, <clears throat> and I think it's important to point out that beef is not the only culprit. Uh, so often we hear about, you know, beef and dairy, beef and dairy being so impactful, uh, and it is, absolutely. Uh, but when, you're, when you start comparing beef and dairy to chicken and eggs, uh, and you know, you'll hear people say, oh, well, just eat chicken and you know, that's better. 
getting into that comparison, it's like comparing rotten apples and oranges. <laughs> There's lots of problems with the chicken industry as well, environmental impact. Uh, so, you know, I just want to be clear that it's not just the cows uh, that are the problem. And one, and I'll just get, there's a lot of reasons why, but I'll get into one of those reasons, and that is the poultry litter. So in these indoor environments uh, with, you know, thousands and thousands of birds, broiler chicken houses, the broiler chickens are, of course, the chickens raised for meat. There's the breeding flocks that are in these indoor environments, cage-free is also in these uh, indoor environments. They put this litter out and it's kind of just sawdust that goes out, but it gets built up with, you know, diseased carcass, carcasses of the dead birds, high concentrations of, of feces, heavy metals, chemicals, bacteria, parasites, pathogens, viruses, all this stuff uh, builds up and then they dump it somewhere uh, and it goes into the groundwater, into the waterways. It has high levels of nutrients like uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. And what this does is it causes eutrophication. And eutrophication is when there's high levels of nutrients in the water, uh, it builds up algae, there's algae blooms and it depletes the oxygen in the water. So these are oxygen depleted waters uh, and it makes it very difficult for life, aquatic life to live. And they're called dead zones. And this is so often caused by poultry, uh, chicken and egg farming, um, as well as, of course, pesticide runoff and stuff like that. So, so just want to be clear that it's not just the cows. Okay, so now we know there's a big problem. We, you know, it is it is now being shouted from the rooftops: meat, dairy, and eggs are impactful on the environment. What do we do about it? Okay, well. This is what the industry says you should do about it. Uh, the industry is on the defensive and they are giving you options. They are giving you all kinds of labels uh, to make you feel better about the product, to tell you that they're, they're on it, they're, they're figuring it out, they're going green. And there's all kinds of labels now that we're seeing. Well, so some of the labels are just straight greenwashing. There is, like zero difference between a conventional product of the same egg, dairy, or, or meat product uh, and theirs, no difference at all. Some of them, there is slightly better situations, uh, but they're still problematic in other ways. And I'll explain about that. And then there's others that are actually worse and I'll, we'll get into that too. Uh, so, it, you know, it, it's it, the pro part of the problem is that you don't know because these labels are just woefully unregulated. I mean, they there's no on site inspection of the farms. The farmers can say whatever they want, uh, with one exception, and we'll get into that. But basically, they can tell you what they want, whatever they want. Their websites can say whatever they want. The, the marketing can say what, whatever they want. So it's very difficult to believe. And a good example is uh, so this. Uh, uh, Maple Hill grass-fed uh, milk, I found and snapped this picture, and I decided to go online and, and learn about Maple Hill Farms. Well, they have 35 farms in Upper State, New York. Okay, do you think that there is grass and that a domestic cow can be out in grass year-round in Upper State, New York? Probably not, <laughs> and most likely not. Uh, it's just not conducive for year-round grazing. And I have heard of grass-fed uh, uh, farms, and I don't know if Maple Hill does this, but I've heard of grass-fed farms that will actually buy cut grass from places uh, lower um, 48 state, you know, lower, the lower states uh, that are growing grass year-round, to ship up to the these more northern states that don't have grass year round to feed their cows that are in confinement barns. So there's they're, they are grass fed, but they're in the confinement barns being cut cut grass that was cut days ago. So it's you know there's a lot of stretching of the truth. There's a lot of deception going on, and we'll we'll talk more about it. Um, and, and one thing I do just want you to consider also is about the size of the farm. So just saying that it, just just because it's a smaller farm doesn't necessarily mean that it's better okay 
it still takes the same amount of resources and uh, 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 you know grain and uh, water and these kinds of things to raise and transport and slaughter these billions of animals. It doesn't matter if they're spread out on different farms. We currently use 55% um, of our fresh water is given to farmed animals. That's not going to change if they're just spread out into you know uh, 10 farms instead of one. It's the same amount of water. Right, so just the size of the farm doesn't necessarily mean that things are better, uh, and also larger farms can be actually more efficient. I mean, they larger farms can utilize technology that actually makes the process less resource intensive, and also transportation can be uh, less because it's concentrated on a larger farm. So, and I'm you know. This is completely case by case and farm by farm. I'm not saying that large operations are always better. I'm just saying that it's not necessarily the case, you know, 100% uh, um, that a small farm is better. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so let's get into these labels. So local. Um, you see this label everywhere. I snapped this picture at a Whole Foods, I believe. It's just uh, ubiqu ubiquitous. You see this label all over the place now. But unfortunately, it means very little when we're talking about a food's carbon footprint. So a food's carbon footprint, how, how much impact uh, on climate change a food has, transportation or the how local the food is component is only 11% of the equation. The production phase is 83% and animal products are heavy on production. And what I mean by that, so when, when they do life cycle assessments for uh, food products and you know, the impact of food, uh, there's seed to plate for plant foods, inception to plate for animal products, and their calculations again and again, when you look at these life cycle assessments, animal products have a much higher impact on the environment, regardless of these labels, the local and sustainable labels. So just buying locally doesn't necessarily mean that you're buying more ecologically or more humanely. It's the energy, the water, the fossil fuel that it takes to produce the product. That's where the impact is and animal products are heavy on that production phase uh, in that production part. Refrigeration, the slaughtering process, all that stuff that takes a lot of energy. So here's an example. So let's say uh, you're at the, you're at the uh, grocery store and you see an organic tomato, but it's from Mexico. And you're like, oh, wow, that had to travel really far, lots of food miles, that can't be very sustainable. How about this local dairy product, like a local uh, organic uh, uh, yogurt? It's got to have less impact, right? Because it's local. No, not necessarily, not at all, because of almost every life cycle assessment that's done will say that that is, has a heavier impact uh, because of the production that had to go into it and the energy consumption that had to go into it. So uh, there's also land use, an issue with land use with local, and um, uh, this is really amazing. So the Oakland Food Policy Council here in the Bay Area, they created the Oakland Food systems assessment, okay? And they calculated how much usable land would be needed to feed 30% of Oakland with local food, just 30% with local food. And they found with vegetable farming that they would need 9,000 acres of land to grow just 30%, just grow food for just 30% of Oakland. Now, that was just plants. If they wanted to add in dairy and eggs and meat, animal products, they would need an additional 10,000 acres of land. So they would need 19,000 acres total to feed the same number of people, the same number of people. So this is where it's, I, I really feel like the local people that are into local farming, the locavores, they need to get on board with vegan, <laughs> with plant farming, because that's really the only way that we can do it uh, and not just destroy, you know, the, the surrounding wild areas. So, and we'll get more into that with free ranging, but uh, I'll just, I'll wrap up the local with this this uh, slide and I'll, I'll read it here. The stuff, there's, um, sorry, a study in the environment, um, oh, let me try again. 
A study in the Journal of Environmental Science and Technology found that switching just two meals a week from meat and dairy to a vegetable-based diet achieves more greenhouse gas reductions than buying all locally sourced food. So the impact really is in plant, is in animal farming, sorry, in animal agriculture. That's where the impact is. And it's so much more impactful than how far your food had to travel. Okay. So uh, next label we're gonna talk about is free range. And so a lot of people assume that the label free range means that it's better environmentally, that the product has in some way is better environmentally. Now, the reason that I use this picture that you're seeing here is that this can be labeled a free range egg farm, egg facility. Uh, this is certainly a cage free egg facility. Uh, this is your, a typical cage free operation. Uh, and, you know, this is there's thousands of birds on top of each other in a you know, windowless, dark, dank, horrible place. Uh, certainly not an ideal situation or life for these animals. But the reason that this can be labeled free range is that the only regulation on free range is that the animals have, quote, access to the outside. And there is nothing said as to what that outside looks like, what, how large it is, how many birds could fit out there or animals could fit out there, uh, uh, how long the, they have access to this space. So basically this uh, chicken house could open a door to maybe a little five foot by five foot concrete patio that is so unappealing, no bird would wanna go out there and uh, is so small, only 20 of these birds could fit out there and they could call that free range and they could have that open for five minutes a day. There's no regulation on how long. And on top of all that, there is no on-site inspection. So nobody is gonna come to check and see if anything is being adhered to. The farmers know that. Uh, they can say whatever they want and their websites can say whatever they want. And I have seen for myself so many times where I've gone to the farm's website, you see rolling hills, you see animals out in the field, and then you actually go and drive to the farm and there is not an animal inside and there are just confinement buildings. So they lie. Uh, okay. That said, there are some farms, both uh, for chicken meat, for, ch for chicken eggs, and for pork production, pigs, that are allowing the animals out into some pasture. And this is where we get into labels like pasture raised. They could be labeled free range, pasture raised, where they're actually being able to, to go out and have some semblance of a natural life. So let's look at that because there are some doing that. Now you don't know which ones because there's no regulation, but there are some doing that. So now whenever there's a transition to a free range or pasture raised situation where they're actually going outside, the animals, we've got the same amount of animals and often a smaller number of animals that are going to need way more space. Okay, so now looking at this picture, Imagine if this farmer says, well, I really, I want to actually go pasture raised. I'm going to give these poor birds the space that they need and deserve to have a nat some semblance of a natural life, right? What he's got right now, he's got this, this building on maybe an acre or half an acre of land. Not even three times the amount of space would be enough. He would have to have seven, eight, ten more acres of land to be able to free range all these birds. Uh, and probably have to reduce the amount of animals he has and the amount of, of, of product he's making and the amount of food he's making. Um, so, you know, it's it, free range and organic and local. They require so much more land for the same or a smaller number of animals. This is a huge problem. This is a scaling up problem that, that they all have. This, almost every label I'm gonna talk about today cannot be scaled up to feed the almost 8 billion people we have on the planet now, uh, but I'll, I'll get more into that. But, so, but as this demand rate rises for these types of products and as these farms start transitioning, we are going to see farms, farmlands uh, replacing and destroying you know, forests and wetlands and prairies and wild spaces to accommodate all these farmed animals. Uh, it's not the direction we need to be moving in at all. 
um, we're going to damage more biodiversity, more impact more species. Uh, we need to be go go moving in the other direction and rewilding. So I'll give an example with free range and pasture raised. So there is a beef and pork farm in Petaluma, and I won't I won't name the name, but but it, there's one in Petaluma, and they are pasture raised uh, pork and beef farm, and they claim to give their animals okay. 10 acres per cow and 50 acres uh, for every 10 pigs. This is on their website. So now we are at 60 acres of land for 11 animals, 11 animals, okay? There's 60,000 people in Petaluma, 60,000 people in Petaluma. How on earth could you feed everyone in Petaluma this meat? You couldn't. I mean, there's not enough space in California to be able, you know, to, in the space around Petaluma. You just can't. It simply can't be done. Um, really, you know, it's just not sustainable. We would need, it's been estimated that we would need closer to five planet Earths to be able to free range and pasture raise all these animals uh, and feed the billions of people on the planet. The, the tiny amount of free ranging that we do now cannot be scaled up. Uh, to feed these billions of people. So, so free ranging animals, all of this, it really, uh, it, it can only be a specialty market for a few elite buyers and as it is now, uh, it can't be scaled up. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to another label and we'll talk about organic. Now organic is the one label, as I said earlier, there was one label that actually does have some regulation and that is organic. Uh, and not just some regulation, it's rigorously regulated. I mean, to get organic certification is, you know, it, it, there's certainly on-site inspection of the farm, there's soil sampling, uh, they, they have to go through a rigorous process. So it is better, I would say, certainly, organic is slightly better. But here's the problem. Okay, the only difference, the only thing they're looking at with organic is that the feed fed to the animals is organic and that the animals are drug free. And, and depending on the species, they have some access to the outside. Those are the only requirements really that are looked at uh, substantially. All the other things that we've been talking about, the greenhouse gas emissions, water use, water pollution, all these things, None of that is looked at, none of that is considered in the organic label for dairy or for eggs. So, so, so that's a problem. And let me uh, show you how it works uh, with a chart. This will give you kind of a visual. So I don't, I unfortunately don't have, usually when I'm giving this PowerPoint presentation, I have like a pointer so I can kind of point to everything, uh, but I can't really do that. And unfortunately my, my little cursor doesn't work uh, in there. So. You'll just, I'll, I'll have to describe it as best as possible. If you can see here, we have uh, three different diets. We've got veganism, vegetarianism in the middle, and at the bottom diet, the standard American diet with meat, dairy, and eggs. There are two lines going across. And of course, the bar going across is the impact, how much impact on climate change these diets have. The dark green line on the bottom of each diet is conventional farming, and the light green line is organic farming. So. Let's all look now at this dark green line at the bottom, that farthest, longest line with the most impact. That is the standard American diet. That's what most people are eating, conventional meat, dairy, and egg diet. So let's say this person that's eating the standard American diet says, you know, I really want to green my diet. I want to eat a lower carbon footprint diet and I'm going to go organic. I'm going to buy all organic dairy and organic eggs and organic meat. Okay. So that's, that's, that's okay, you have made some impact. You're going to go to the next light green line up there uh, in, in the diet that includes meat, uh, that light green line across, and you have reduced your impact by 8%. Okay, that's something, that's something. But let's set that aside. And let's say this person says, you know, I, I really wanna green my diet. I, uh, you know, really wanna eat, eat better uh, environmentally. I'm going to go vegan. And now we're not even talking about organic at all. We're just talking conventional vegan food. Okay, now you're going to drop down to that dark green line at the top under veganism, the dark green line, and you have reduced your impact by 87%. Now we're talking, right? Now we've really made some impact. 
And if you want to take it all the way and go uh, 100% uh, organic vegan, we go up to that tiny little uh, light green line and you've reduced your impact by 94%. So sure, organic makes some difference. But where you're really making an impact is when you reduce or eliminate animal products. Okay. So moving on to the next uh, label, grass-fed. So grass-fed, this is the one where at the beginning when I was talking about that some of them can be even worse, this is the one. We are now learning that grass-fed beef can actually create more greenhouse gases, 50 to 60% more greenhouse gas emissions and use more water and more land, of course. So, <laughs> ah, I mean, why are people buying grass-fed beef? They think it's better environmentally, but uh, unfortunately we're learning that it's not. It can take 18 to 24 months longer to get the animal up to market weight, to slaughter weight. And that extends the amount of time that they're alive I have burping, burping greenhouse gases, drinking the clean water, creating pollution. Uh, there was a professor of dairy science, sciences at the Washington State University that conducted a comprehensive comparison of conventional and grass-fed, conventional feedlot beef and grass-fed beef. And she found that producing the same amount of beef, the conventional feedlot beef actually required less land, less water, less fossil fuels, and to produce the least greenhouse gases. So <laughs> why are we even, ah, it's so frustrating. Um, and, and just a little clarification, grass-fed, of course, we're talking about cows now, beef and dairy, uh, sometimes lamb. If you see the, the picture of the label that I took, that is grass-fed lamb. And then when you, when you hear free range or pasture raised, usually that's chickens or pigs. So that's kind of the difference. There's some crossover there, but just some clarification. So but getting back to grass-fed. So now this is where someone would say, well, hang on a minute, hang on, hang on, hang on. You can't just throw the cows out there and think it's all gonna be okay. You know, you can't just let them out of the barn and, you know, not, you know, let, and, and, and it'll be fine. There's management practices that have to be done. You have to have management. Okay. So let's talk about that. Now, this is the new, of course, darling of the foodie community, of the environmental food community, and that is regenerative agriculture, animal agriculture. And it has a lot of different names. There's holistic management, short duration, short duration grazing, uh, you know, and rotational grazing, all of these different names for the same thing, basically. And I'll explain what it is. I use this image, again, I wish I had my pointer uh, to explain, but um, uh, so basically you've got a large area of land and you fence it into sections, okay? Fence it off into sections. And you've got a very small number of animals <laughs> uh, and you put them into one of these sections and they will graze. And as they graze, of course, uh, cows are very heavy. As I mentioned earlier, they, you know, they compact the ground, they pudge the, the soil, they degradate everything. And, uh, and um, especially when they're in such a small space. And then, so at, when, after that has been grazed down, they will remove one of the fences, move the cows over to another section, put the fence back up and the space that they were regenerates and the space that they're in, they graze. So, and then that goes around and goes around. So that's what it is. Okay, well, no matter what, <laughs> even besides all the other points I'm going to make, you have to use a large amount of area for a very small amount of animals. Again, we can't scale this up to feed billions of people. It just can't be done. Uh, you know, it's, it's, that is the inherent problem. Uh, and then on top of that, there's been four decades of trials and studies on this. This isn't new. We ha there have been uh, people uh, studying this, uh, uh, running tests, doing, uh, um, you know, um, 
research on this uh, started in Africa, and there's been 50 trials in Africa, you know, um, scientific studies. And unfortunately, after all kinds of peer reviewed science, it shows that this management approach just really isn't better than conventional grazing. Uh, it was concluded, this is a quote, that short duration, short duration, I don't know why I can't say that tonight, short duration grazing systems differ little from their effect upon range conditions. So there's been lots of experimentation done and the majority of this experimentation does not support the claims of any of these enhanced ecological benefits that they're claiming that it's been rigorously evaluated, numerous investigations, multiple locations, wide range, wide range of precipitation zones. And it just, it doesn't increase the soil sequestering as it's been said to do it. There's not the increase of plant and animal reduction. Unfortunately, it just doesn't hold water. And, you know, it also requires extensive fencing, which uh, disrupts wildlife migration and movement patterns. There's all kinds of problems with it. Um, so free ranging, grass fed, rotational grazing, it's something that people really want to believe is true. They want their beef burgers, <laughs> but it just doesn't hold water scientifically. And if you want to get deeper into this, like it's, there's it's kind of so much to it that I can't really get really deep in, uh, but there is a writer, Nicholas Carter, who has written extensively about this really detailed uh, debunking this, uh, this, this form of grazing. So Nicholas Carter, if you look him up, uh, he's written on, a couple, I think, Sentient Media and uh, One Green Planet. He has articles on this. Uh, there was actually one today that was, that was posted that was great. Uh, I can't remember what it was. I just saw it today. Uh, but anyway, so there's a lot of debunking going on. Okay, so the, the wildlife conflict. This is another place where, you know, I, I just don't understand how environmentalist people that are environmentally minded can uh, support something that is going to put more farmed animals into wild areas, right? And into places that should be being rewilded and reforested. Uh, it's very frustrating. And there is a lot already, already as, you know, as it is now, there's a lot of wildlife conflict. And we would just increase that by going to these other methods. So one of these places, one place that uh, is having this kind of conflict is in the Point Reyes National Seashore. Of course, I'm in Sacramento. So it's about uh, three hours um, west of me on the coast. And uh, there is a beautiful species of elk there, an endangered species of elk called the Thule elk. They're a smaller species of elk. And there are only about 500 Thule elk left in the Point Reyes National Seashore. Uh, but there is a ton of dairy and beef farming. In fact, the dairy cows outnumber the elk 10 to 1 in this area and there's been a lot of conflict and and the ranchers are now wanting to go out they're shooting the elk they're keeping the elk from from water sources they don't want the elk to eat their grass and their water for their cows so now for-profit privately owned beef and dairy uh businesses are threatening um you know the wildlife in these public national parks and that would only increase if we wanted to go to these free range, local, all these methods I've been talking about. Um, so this issue has gotten a lot of attention locally. And this is one place where animal and environmental activists are coming together uh, to try to get the dairy cows out of uh, this national, for, uh, national park. Uh, OK. So um, I, I'm, I know time is probably ticking. I'm, I'm aware of it. I, I just have a little bit more I want to go over. And uh, my next slide is graphic. I will give uh, a warning. Um, but I feel it is important for us to see. Uh, and I don't want us to forget that we are talking about individuals, sentient beings. And, uh, and what happens to them in the end is this. This is what happens in the end. Uh, no matter the label, no matter how they're raised, uh, they are going to go to a brutal slaughter. And 
not only brutal slaughter, but there's separation of family, painful body mutilations, uh, monotony, extreme psychological distress from taking babies away, there's um, slaughter at a very young age. The human equivalent of their teens is when they go to slaughter. Killing healthy animals for food that we do not need, uh, it, it, no matter how the animal was raised, it's just not cons consistent with being compassionate, kind, ethical. Please don't disconnect from the emotional reality, the violence of killing an animal. Um, this is a quote from a former small scale goat farmer, quote, to watch a sentient being gasp for air and to look into his eyes filled with fear and see the blood coming from his neck. It's the most heart wrenching, awful thing. And I say former goat farmer because that goat farmer is now vegan. Okay, so I'm going to get into just a couple of issues in the ethics. Uh, there's so much to it, of course, but these are two that relate to sustainable and humane labels. And I just want to talk briefly about them. One is organic dairy and mastitis. So in organic dairy, just like conventional dairy, the cows are artificially inseminated. Of course, a cow only lactates, gives milk when they have been pregnant and they've given birth so they are kept artificially inseminated again and again. As soon as the baby is born, the baby is taken from them. It causes severe psychological distress for both the baby and the mother. Uh, so this is a constant in their lives. Um, it's, it's, it's very difficult for a dairy cow and they're often sick. They're sick from just the stress. And they will often get what's called mastitis. And mastitis is an infection of the udder. The udder can swell, get um, uh, painful sores. It, it hurts. It's very, very painful for them to be milked when they have like a, a, a flare up of mastitis. So on conventional, in conventional farming for years and years and years, what dairy farmers have done is they have given the cows antibiotics and pharmaceuticals to clear up the infections, to clear up the mastitis, to clear up any sickness. Well, on organic, in the organic standards, uh, the regulations are such that they cannot give them antibiotics and pharmaceuticals. If you remember, one of the main parts of, dairy, of organic dairy is that the animals are drug free. And that has to do with human health really only because then the, the drugs go through to the humans uh, who are drinking the milk. So it's really just for human health. But I actually uh, had a, a veterinarian, when I was researching my book, I had a veterinarian who had been doing uh, organic, or uh, had been doing dairy farming, dairy farming for decades, uh, a veterinarian for dairy farming in Sonoma County for decades. And he confided in me that he, he was seeing cows with the most advanced stages of mastitis in the worst pain on organic dairy farms, just in the last decade, these farms that transitioned to organic, suddenly these cows were in severe pain at milking. Uh, and it's because they weren't giving them the antibiotics and medications because they would have to take her out of production and couldn't sell her milk. It's about making money. So, uh, so they don't, they just, they're just suffering. And so this is a place where these labels can make it even worse for uh, animals. Okay, I'm gonna move on to one more thing uh, in the ethics, little ethics section here. And that has to do with, with eggs, the egg, egg production and any label really. Uh, and something that people don't realize and don't know. And that is that there are billions of baby male chicks that are killed in the industry as soon as they're born. And the reason for that is that there are two strands of uh, chickens now, genetic strands that have been you know, uh, genetically manipulated for years and years. Uh, um, uh, uh, the, there's the egg layers that lay eggs, of course, and the broiler chickens that are raised for meat. The egg layers, uh, the, the broilers, of course, are, are, you know, they get really big fat, they get meaty fast, very, they're within just six weeks to 12 weeks, they are full grown and ready for slaughter. It's crazy. They're just babies and they're full grown. They've been bred to be that way. The egg layers, of course, half of them are male, half of them don't lay eggs and they don't grow fast enough to be profitable for meat. They've got tons of broiler chickens doing that already. So they're just a waste product for the industry and they're thrown away 
by the billions. If you see this picture on the left, uh, they're just thrown out into dumpsters. They die from being crushed by the weight of their brothers. Uh, the ones on top will die of exposure, dehydration. It's just horrible. Over on the right, these are the babies that are going down conveyor belts and dropping into maceration machines and being just ground up alive. I mean, uh, sorry, this is, it's, you know, still hard for me, even after 30 years of, of uh, talking about it. It's still difficult. Uh, and, you know, th this is a newborn baby chick. This is a symbol in our society of, of, of love and of, uh, you know, new life and springtime and uh, kindness. And here we're killing them by the billions. And it doesn't matter the label. No chick, uh, no um, egg operation, whether they're free range or pasture raised or whatever, they can't hatch their own chicks profitably. If they're hatching their own chicks, it's a hobby farm. They're not making enough money to be profitable. So they can't profitably hatch their own chicks. They all source their chicks from these horrible hatcheries. Uh, so, all right, I will move on from the ethics section. Thank you for this to that section. So I'm going to wrap up soon, uh, just a little, little bit more, getting very near the end, and we'll start, we'll open up to Q&A. But I want to end with uh, another stat, this last, last scientific stat with the environmental stuff, and I think it's a really, really important one. And this one is from the Alliance of World Scientists. And the Alliance of World Scientists, it's 15,000 scientists in 184 countries. And they were asked to uh, come together, you know, collaborate on what would be the most impactful thing for an individual to do to curb climate change, for their individual action, an individual to reduce their climate footprint. What's the most impactful thing they can do? What they came up with? avoid all animal products. That's what they came up with. That's the number one thing they said that someone could do to reduce their impact on climate change. They didn't say buy, you know, uh, grass-fed beef or pasture-raised eggs. They didn't say, they didn't even say reduce your amount of animal products. They said avoid all animal products. So I thought that was really impactful. Okay. Uh, so I, I recommend these two films, Countdown to Year Zero and Endgame 2050, a little bit more about what we've been talking about, a lot more about what we've been talking about. These two films are jam-packed with amazing information, and they're both available on Amazon Prime, I'm sure other places too, uh, so I really recommend those two films. Hopefully you got them, I'm gonna move on. Uh, if not, we can go back if somebody wants to, to see them again or write them down. Uh, and I wanna give a little plug for my podcast. I started a pandemic podcast when all my events completely <laughs> uh, ended uh, back in April, March, and I started this podcast and uh, I've been enjoying it. It's been a lot of fun. I hope you can maybe listen in. It is mostly ethics, but I do get into some environmental stuff as well. And hopefortheanimalspodcast.org is the website where you could check out all the episodes. And I also want to recommend my book, uh, The Ultimate Betrayal, Is There Happy Meat? And a lot of the stats and figures that I that I talked about throughout this presentation are in my book, uh, and much more, of course. There's an entirely huge uh, environmental section, of course, because it's me. And uh, what else? I think that's it. And I will just end with this quote from my book, it is not our methods of animal agric agricultural practices that need to change. It is our unwillingness to let go of animal products and animal farming. Thank you so much, Hope, for your time and for such an interesting and compelling presentation. Um, we have quite a, quite a bit of questions that were submitted, so hopefully we can get to them all. I'll start off by reading them and then um, you can take it away from there. So the first one that we have is, how does local food cost impact differ for fruits, vegetables, and beans versus meat? Food costs? How does local food cost, yeah, impact differ for fruits, vegetables, beans versus meat? Okay, I'm trying to understand the question. I think what you're asking is, what is the difference uh, with the cost of the two? 
Co cost on the environment or cost like price? I'm sorry, I'm not understanding the yeah, question. It, it's a bit ambiguous. Um, maybe we can address the environmental point of um, this question. The environmental cost. Uh, well, I, I went into that uh, in, the, in the local section uh, quite extensively, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But what else could I say about it? <laughs> um, you know, again, bottom line with local, uh, it, it means very little. The transportation sector or part of a food's carbon footprint is very little. The, the, how far the food had to travel um, is not very impactful. It's only 11% of the equation of how impactful uh, the food is, the, food, the, you know, the impact is. So yeah, I mean, the, the, the local um, animal, local plant foods, great. You know, if you wanna eat locally, that's wonderful, um, but it again, it just doesn't have a lot to do environmentally. More so, animal products are impactful because of their heavy uh, production, fossil fuel use, all those things that I said. There, I'm trying to remember because there was a, a section, a part of the local thing that I cut out because of time, and I'm trying to remember what it was, but I don't remember. Um, but I think I, I went over it pretty extensively with with what I said in the. Sure. So, you Thank you. Clarify the question a little more because maybe I'm not understanding the question. The next question we have is how does the production cost of new plant based meats compare to real meat production? Ah, okay. And, and now we're probably talking environmental <laughs> costs. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, the thing with new, uh, well, the meat alternatives, um, the, mock, the, the, the mocking meats where they're actually like meat, impossible foods and beyond burger. I'm assuming this is what we're talking about. Um, environmentally, uh, they are a lot better than meat and you can go to their websites and see the stats. Uh, but again, if you're comparing to plant foods, um, plant foods are gonna win every time uh, compared to something processed. I mean, these are still plant foods, of course, but it's something more processed. So the higher the processing, of course, the more fossil fuel that was required. Uh, but when you compare these things, the, the burgers and you know, impossible burger stuff to animal products, now you're really getting a comparison and then and animal products are always more impactful. Uh, so, Yes, they're better, um, better environmentally, uh, but um, but you know, a, 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 I would say a, a less processed bean burger is going to be a little better. But when you're in the realm of plant foods, you've reduced your impact so much, so it's a good place to be. Thank you. Yeah. Our next question here is: Is a B Corp certification a truly green, sustainable label? I think this is a really interesting question because B Corp is typically viewed as like the holy grail of certifications, right? Yet you still see a lot of dairy or meat um, organizations, corporations that are B Corp certified. What, what, what is it? B Corp certification. B Corp? B as in boy and then oh, Corp. B Corp. I'm not familiar mm -hmm. with it. I'm sorry. Okay, no worries. <laughs> You can move on to the next one then. Is there any truth to the idea of regenerative grazing where grazing animals are supposed to help capture carbon into the soil? So I feel like you've essentially addressed this already in your presentation. If there's anything else you'd like to add. Well, I will add that I don't, I wouldn't say that every situation is horrible and not helping. You know, I think it's really on a case by case basis, on a farm by farm basis. But again, you're not gonna know because there's no regulation on the label. Uh, but overall, I mean, even if you've got a, a farm that's that's somehow figured out to do it really right, that, that they are having soil regeneration. And unfortunately, the, the, the peer reviewed science overwhelmingly says that that's not happening. But like I said, on a case by case basis, I think there could be a farm that does figure it out they're gonna to have to use so many less animals for all their acres of land. Again, going back to that, uh, you know, that, that pasture-raised beef and pork in Petaluma, you just can't feed enough people. 
you know, the, it, it, it's, it's, it's one of those things where I think I think it's going to get into kind of an elitist thing, where when we get to a point where um, you know it, where we're so environmentally taxed that we can we that we just have to do something, uh, and the only meat that you know that that the, the I I feel like you know if you like like we're going back to the Oakland like feeding Oakland you know the thirty percent. Uh, locally um, and having to use so much more land for animal products, it's almost like it's only people that are going to be able to afford it and be in rural areas, you know, are the ones that are going to be able to have these, you know, other these alternative labels. Um, and that's going to be more affluent, uh, more privileged people that are living in Sebastopol or someplace like that, you know. If we want to feed everyone, these labels uh, and this, you know, it, 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 it's really, um, it just can't be done. We don't have enough land. We can't scale it up, so. It's a great transition to this next question. Uh, Jane's curious, if we all went vegan, how much more farmland would be needed to produce the protein our bodies need? I'm thinking specifically beans, nuts, seeds, mushrooms, etc. Right how much more land we wouldn't need more. <laughs> Here's how it works. So, and uh, I think that um, if you watch Cowspiracy, they have a great graphic about this, but, but uh, let's say we've got, you know, this much land, I wish I could do a graphic of it, you know, is being used for pasture and raise, pasture and graze land. So the animals being pastured, the, the beef and dairy that are, that are being pastured. And then the grain that is grown to feed those animals. And then down here in some little corner, we've got the plant foods that are going to humans. I mean, that's a very small portion of this huge amount of land that we're using for food production is going to plants that are going to feed humans, right? So if we got rid of the animals, we weren't, we weren't farming animals anymore. We weren't breeding and farming the animals. We could get rid of that entire area of pasture land reforest it, rewild it, all that could go back to forest and rangeland. Uh, and then the, a good portion of the land that's being used for that grain growing that's going to feed the animals, probably half or more of that could also be replanted, reforested. We wouldn't need it. And we could just use a, a small portion of that for the increase of plant foods. Uh, so it, we'd, we'd still just need a small portion of this big portion of land that we're using. Uh, so, you know, we would need a little bit more, uh, but not much. And we've and we're already using it to raise, to grow the grain that's going to feed the animals. Uh, so I hope that is, was clear. I wish I had like, I could create a graphic right here. <laughs> Just so. with your hands. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Hope. Um, uh, anonymous attendee asks, a lot of organic produce is fertilized using animal byproducts, manure, blood meal, bone meal, etc. How does this impact the environment and is there a way we can avoid this? Veganic farming. And I actually thought about getting into it. It's, it was, there was so much to cover. Uh, yes, it's true. And people, I think, don't realize just how much uh, animal product, animal input is used in farming and even in organic farming, as uh, this person pointed out, uh, there is manure and blood meal and bone meal and feathers and all kinds of stuff that's used for the fertilizer. That can be transitioned to plant sources and veganic farming is doing that. Veganic farming is vegan organic farming and it's getting more and more popular. Uh, there are farms that are transitioning to veganic farming and they use animal, I'm sorry, no animal inputs, all plant, uh, you know, nitrogen fixers and all that stuff for the, for the soil. Uh, and it can be done, it can be scaled up. And yeah, we need to be doing it more and more. I mean, you know, we, we see all the time uh, when there are E. coli outbreaks and salmonella outbreaks and Campylobacter and all these terrible uh, pathogens and viruses that get into the food and cause outbreaks. And then, you know, there's recalls. 
even when, and see, and people I don't think understand this, even when it's a recall of lettuce or spinach or whatever it is, the reason that E. coli is on there is because of animal product, because of the animal inputs, because of the animal manure and the, and the, the use of the animal inputs. Uh, it comes from the animals. E. coli, it's from the colon, that's where the name comes from. So, so we could not only uh, reduce, you know, the uh, animal inputs and, and all the, the problems with uh, uh, all the environmental impact problems, but also solve uh, what are the main sources of our food contamination problems, uh, which is using animal products. Uh, so, you know, I, I often ha I've had people say this, like, you know, oh, well, lettuce will get you sick too, you know, when there's outbreaks. It's like, no, 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 you don't understand. <laughs> That's all coming from the animals, you know, so. Okay, is this something that people can learn more about in your book or your organization's website or you have any recommendations? Uh, this particular is not in my book. I wish I had gotten into veganic farming. I did not. I might have mentioned it. But I certainly don't don't dig into it, uh, and and I don't think UPC has anything about it either. That's too bad. Uh, <laughs> I'm not really sure uh, where to tell you to go, but there's a lot of information online. I mean, if you just Google, you know, veganic farming. Sure. Yeah. Do you have time for a few more questions? Sure, we can go all night. Okay. The next one. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts on raising a few chickens in your backyard? Oh, well, you mean me personally? No, <laughs> I guess we're talking about people. Um, so uh, I don't have chickens myself, but the organization that I work for, United Poultry Concerns, we do have a sanctuary with over 150 resident birds in Virginia, uh, just to plug uh, UPC, United Poultry Concerns, uh, and, our, and our resident birds that we love very dearly. As far as backyard chickens goes, uh, my position and, and UPC's position is that, uh, yes, please adopt chickens, love chickens, but there's stipulations. There's, there are necessary components to making it an ethical situation. Uh, and one of the main things is that you want to rescue a chicken. You do not want to ever buy or purchase a chick or a chicken because they're coming from the hatcheries, even if it's on Craigslist, even if it's at the feed store, they're all coming from those hatcheries that I told you about. Uh, and these heartless, horrible hatcheries, you know, so it's better not to buy, but you can rescue a chicken. There are animal sanctuaries that are adopting out chickens. There uh, are uh, sometimes chickens come into the Humane Society and need homes. So rescuing a chicken is a great way to go. Basically, you want to look at the situation like how you would treat a cat or a dog coming into your home. They're your companion, your friend, and you want to care for them in the same way. Uh, if they are in the backyard, you do have to have a very secure uh, place for them to be in at night. A coop needs to be cleaned regularly. They get nasty, so be ready to clean a lot. Uh, and also veterinary care. It can get expensive and you want to um, be sure that they have the care that they need. So there's, you know, it's just like when you consider getting a dog or a cat, you want to make all those considerations for a chicken. Uh, but yeah, it can be a really wonderful and a rewarding and incredible experience to, uh, to have a companion animal chicken, a friend. Well, I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> The very last question for tonight, organic is certified by third parties. Are there specific certifiers that do a better job of auditing and verifying the farms that consumers should look for? Okay, and, and you're talking beyond organic, I assume. Uh, these, all these other labels that we've been talking about. And, and are we talking animal products? Is that what they're asking about? They did not specify, no. Well. Unfortunately. Yeah, that's okay. I'll say, I, I'm pretty sure that possibly what they were what they meant because this is the question that I always get at the end of this of this uh, presentation so often is well what which labels can we trust which labels should we buy <laughs> I mean I have looked into this extensively and it you know, the, the, unfortunately what you see on the website and what you see on the carton is not what you see when you go to the farm it's completely different, generally and usually. Um, so, 
you know, you can't believe what they're saying. Uh, so my suggestion is don't waste your money on something that's, you know, outrageously expensive. Reduce the amount of eggs you eat. Instead of, instead of switching to pasture raised and wasting a bunch of money on something that might not be any better, reduce the amount of eggs that you eat, reduce the amount of animal products. Um, instead of switching, reduction. That's my suggestion. And hopefully eventually, uh, and I, you know, it, it, and, and I'll go back to the ethics here because, you know, I, I, I really do believe that of course, we need to encourage reduction and people need to take it at their own pace. Um, absolutely. But to me, you know, one, one animal suffering and dying is one too many. So I dare to ask for a compassionate vegan world. Great. Thank you so much, Hope. So we are uh, approaching the end of our event tonight. Uh, the proud winner of your new book, uh, the Ultimate Betrayal is Their Happy Me is K.A. Uh, Kate, you will be receiving an email from Hope, so please be on the lookout for that. And for those of you that attended today, I will be sending you a link to Hope's um, organization as well as her podcast. Any, uh, any final words, Hope, before we end tonight? Um, I, I, I think that, that that was a good place to end, and I just appreciate everyone coming, and thank you so much for caring. Thank you for your uh, caring for the environment and your compassion, and uh, I just uh, pray that we can turn this corner and, and turn this uh, planetary disaster around, and, you know, and, and we can't rely on the government to do this. Obviously, uh, you know, it, it's got to happen more quickly than that. So we need individual action and we need extreme individual action. And I hope that um, uh, you will, uh, uh, you know, take that action in any way that you can and um, live a joyful vegan life. Well said. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.